Welcome back to What's New with Mead. We are in episode 42, and I have Alan Martin, who is the um, AMMA, or American Mead Maker Association, uh, Mead Maker of the Year. Almost, I was blanked on that with making sure I was right. Better and so uh, <laughs> that could have been embarrassing. Uh, Alan, how are you doing? I'm doing great, man. Thanks for having me on. Yeah, thanks for taking some time. Um, so I... I hope to, as we chat today, to just kind of, like I said earlier, pick your brain about some different mead-related things, and um, hopefully, I would love to pick your brain about contest stuff, especially. Not just entering, but like planning meads, because obviously, the if no one knows, the Mead Maker of the Year is decided through a lot of contest based things. Am I correct? Oh yes. Several contests throughout the United States throughout the whole year. And so it's in, um, will you, I don't, I don't want to butcher it. Will you explain that whole process itself? Cause I feel like I won't do it justice if I try to explain it. So every year the AMMA will pick a handful of contests. Most of them are meat only. Some of them are big, brew contests that have meat included mm -hmm. um, and points are accumulated for each contest uh, that you enter. As long as you're a member of the AMMA, they will go towards meat maker of the year. Mm -hmm. So you enter these contests, uh, uh, hoping to accumulate as many points as possible. You're sending your meads all over the United States to these different contests. It's a lot of work. It's a lot of expense. But mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, if you're very competitive like I am, you, you do what need, you need to do and hopefully your meads are good and you get good scores and you make a lot of points. And at the end of the year, they tally them all up and whoever has the most points wins. Oh, so and, and you know in advance which contests are, are um, going towards this or do you not know? Like, how does that work? Absolutely. Yeah, the AMMA on their website has a list of the – um, contests that will count towards their points for Mead Maker of the Year. Obviously, there's a lots of other contests throughout the United States that you can enter, uh -huh. but only, only a handful of them count towards the AMMA's Mead Maker of the Year. So the ones, uh, I, I'm assuming Mazer Cup, was Valkyrie's Horn one of those? Like, what are some of them from this year, if you recall? Um, Midwinter is another one. Um, uh, Michigan Mead Cup is another big one. Uh, well, you kind of put me on the spot. Remember I'm the sorry, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm sure you don't have the list there. Um, that's not a big deal at all. That's uh, that. Okay, so coming into this, I was uh, somewhat aware of that process, but now I'm glad to know that. And I think that's interesting, especially for people who are, are in, like you or in your shoes, who are uh, ultra competitive to want to go and pursue that. And you're right. I can only imagine, I, I just shipped out two uh, boxes of mead today to some buddies and um, it, was, it was a little expensive. So I can only imagine the expense of course, making your brew that you you're submitting and then of course you have to ship it and entry fees you've undoubtedly spent a few bucks on contest well fees we'll just call them um over this time absolutely yeah usually the entry fee is going to be anywhere from five to ten dollars per entry mm -hmm. uh, some of the contests you know only allow a very limited maybe three uh, especially during the covid and then others are allowing like 10 mm -hmm. so you know, if you're doing $10 an entry, 10 entries, that's $100 just for entry fees. And then you yeah, got to yeah. ship sometimes three bottles per entry. That's 30 bottles. That's a lot of weight, a lot of size is going to cost. Yeah. So uh, what is that the biggest, like what's the, the most meads you have submitted in one go? Has it been 10 entries and 12. 30 bottles? I think 12. Wow, man. Um. That's, that's interesting. So um, my friend doing the most and I, we were doing a contest or contest competition itself. And um, it's called Mead Stampede. And so we're planning for 2022 and doing all that stuff. And uh, we, you know, we've talked about how many entries to allow. And so we're doing like three entries and then we have a special contest. So the fourth entry will be that. What, what competition, I guess my question is, um, 
which competition allowed you or said like you could submit that many or didn't have a cap? I'm curious. I don't remember off the top of my head which one. So each, right. each contest, you know, you have to get online and see what their rules are and what their mm -hmm. entry requirements are. They can be very, very specific as far as obviously the amount you can enter and also what kind of bottles you can put it in, mm -hmm. you know, size requirements. Um, you don't want to do all that, send your meat in, and then have it disqualified because it's in a too big of a bottle. Right. So, Right. You really want to pay attention to all the rules of that contest. Yeah. Yeah. I, um, uh, I've sent off some things and you do need to read the fine print, especially just to make sure you do the right things. Cause it is a, a very large bummer. I've had one incident where I shipped off some bottles and it, it wasn't an incident that I sent the wrong thing. It was, I had packaged it like a, you know, small child. I was just trying to make sure that nothing could possibly break. And then, I guess whoever UPS guy, FedEx guy was moving it must have, I don't know, Hulk smashed it because it turned into mush. And I got a picture from the contest organizer. He was like, hey, sorry, but uh, I only got one of your bottles. So uh, obviously there's there are risks and rewards. And, and on that note, I think anybody listening, just make sure you uh, package your stuff very well. Obviously that's super important. Uh, you don't want to lose anything like that. So now I have a question for you. Um, kind of going backwards, we've talked about, obviously you are the 2021 Media Maker of the Year and uh, um, you had to have started somewhere. What or when did you start making mead? Uh, probably about five years ago. Um, I was at a, just a, kind of a bottle share, beer people, um, and in, in comes Carvin Wilson, you know, mm -hmm. most, most people in the, in the meat community know Carvin Wilson. Um, he comes in and, and he had four or five of his, his meads that he had made. And I got introduced to him and I didn't think I was going to like me because I had heard it was similar to wine. Mm -hmm. And I, at the time I didn't like wine. Um, but anyways, knowing Carvin now, he's a, very outgoing uh, personality. He came over to me and put his arm around me and said, come over here and taste my meat. You will like them. So very, very, yeah, yeah. <laughs> very confident. And he started popping open his meats one at a time and pouring them in my glass. And oh my God. Yeah. I, I fell in love with meat on the spot. I remember I had a beer in my left hand and it was my favorite beer. It was a golden monkey. And in the next 30 minutes or so, that got warm. And I, <laughs> I'm drinking these meads, yeah. you know, and, and just loving it. And they're all high ABV, so I'm feeling pretty good. Uh -huh. And I remember looking over to my wife in the, in the room and saying, Jackie, I'm going to make this. <laughs> and she kind of laughed it off and Carvin kind of laughed it off. And here I am five years later, mead maker of the year. So, Man, that's wild. So – after that inspiration, what was the first thing you went to make? Was it something that he had introduced you to, or did you kind of go go rogue and try your own thing? No, I just i I thought about different flavors that I really like. You know, everybody says make a traditional first, make a traditional first, get good at making a traditional first, which isn't bad advice, um, but that's not fun, right? You want to make right, what, yeah. You want to make what you want to make. Mm -hmm. uh, so I think the first thing I made was uh, an orange creamsicle. Whoa, that is, that is a pretty <laughs> radical thing to go for. <laughs> oh, man. It, it didn't come out that well. Um, How did you – so I've, I've only done it once, and I, I have cheated completely to the utmost. I, there's that Amoretti flavoring, and I threw it into one at one point. It wasn't – I mean, it wasn't great. How did you achieve or try to achieve um, orange creamsicle? So lots of oranges, obviously, for the orange flavoring. And then mm -hmm. as you did, I cheated and went to a, an extract. Yeah. An actual cream extract. Mm -hmm. um, you know, vanilla works, things of that nature. But uh, extracts can, can, can be used, I, I, this is my, my opinion, Mm -hmm. sparingly with some meads that work out well, but if you rely on them too much, inevitably they're going to break down into, into a weird chemical 
form and they're going to taste weird and smell weird. That's yeah. my opinion. No, I've, I've noticed, um, you know, I, I used a lot of those Amoretti products and uh, I did a recently did a tasting of like four or five that I just let set for a while. And some, some of them are fine, but after a while you kind of go, eh, I don't know if this is the best. Uh, and, and I say this full disclosure that I, um, I've used a lot of Amoretti in the past and I have promoted it and I, I don't think it's a, a bad product by any means. It, but for, to your point, there is just like every brew, a shelf life um, for things. And so uh, I don't know that the shelf life for extracts is as long as real fruit. But I, I also don't have scientific as evidence to, to say that. I just have, you know, one or two year uh, tasting right. experience. Something for someone to try out there. It'd be interesting. That is a, a wild start. I, <laughs> creamsicle, that, that is a, quite the Hail Mary. Um, so, so you did that one. And obviously, like you and everybody else who makes a mead, you probably went, whether it was good or bad, okay, I got to make another. Um, did you, I'm sure at this point you have found a couple recipes that you like to make. Is there anything that you have, um, well, I guess, what are some of your standards now that you like to make around your brew house? Well, just, just to go back the next, before I talk about what's my favorites now, <laughs> the next mead that I made being from New England we didn't always eat peanut butter and jellies. We had fluff and utters. Mm, okay. Which is peanut butter and marshmallow fluff. Yeah. I wanted to make a mead that tasted like a fluff and utter. So that was <laughs> another crazy thing I did first. And I actually entered it into my first contest, which was Mazer Cup, probably wow. four years ago. And it actually made it to the second table. Wow. Okay. It scored like a 40 out of 50. So dang, that's good. That's pretty good. But uh, now that I've been making mead for uh, quite some time now, um, I like session traditionals. Mm. Uh, the sweet clover that I got is just delicious. Um, I also like basswood um, traditionals. Um, if you've ever had that honey, it's got a slight it. lemon kind of almost uh, menthol. Ah, that does seem like it, it, it yield well to a hydromel, to a session mead. Very good. And then uh, pie mints. I, I really have come to, like I said earlier, that I didn't like wine. Well, I have now tasted wines over and over and over. Now I like wine. Mm -hmm. especially <laughs> you the just big, have to have good wine. <laughs> especially the big, bold reds. So I like making pie mints. Um, this past Mazer Cup, I actually took second and third in the pimate category. So wow. Very, Man. very happy about that. Winning a major cup is hard enough, but to win two out of three of the cups for that category was, was a uh, reward. That's impressive, man. So um, I got a question about hydromels. Uh, obviously, like I said, kind of your, your thing, whenever you are, are you making hydromels? and like stabilizing a back sweetening with the, the uh, original honey in, in forced carving or are you not forced, like are you not carbonating? Because I feel like when you get to like a lower seven, eight percent ABV brew, it's hard to build out body unless you're just throwing tons of oak or something in. Yeah, so typically I'm gonna carbonate uh, those, uh -huh. those session um, meads. Um, that's one of the reasons I like having my keyser is I can just keg it, mm -hmm. force carbonate it. Um, with all of my meads, I kind of follow a certain plan that I do is I always give the yeast just enough sugars to get to the ABV I want mm -hmm. when it's completely dry. Right. And then I back sweeten to taste. Okay. Right. Obviously right after it's done fermenting, I'll, I'll cold crash, stabilize it transfer it or transfer it first then stabilize it mm -hmm. um and then you know 24 hours after stabilization you can put whatever you want in there and it's not going to re-ferment right yeah i um i recently have been finally getting into the kegging game and it is a game changer i mean 
Uh, bottle carving, if there are a lot of people listening who are going to say, well, I can only bottle carb. And, and I hope that those people don't hear me say that that's a bad thing. Uh, kegging is just so nice. I mean, having full capability to back sweeten with whatever you want is so nice. Whereas bottle carving, you, you really have to uh, plan things well and then use sub substituting sugars like erythritol or stuff that's non-fermentable. It's just not the same. You know, if you're using a basswood honey, erythritol and ba uh, basswood honey are not going to be on the same playing field. So. And to finish answering your question, um, when I'm doing a traditional, typically I'm going to back sweeten with that uh, honey that I used in primary. Uh -huh. Sometimes I'll add a little bit of this honey or a little bit of that honey to kind of Give it a little bit more complexity, but for the most part, I'm going to try to highlight that honey. Mm. And which is, I like that you also talked, obviously, the original honey is best, in my opinion, just because you want to keep whatever traditional mead you're going for. But there are complementary honeys. And, um, you know, I made a, what was it? One time I made a, oh gosh, it was, oh, it was a, a buckwheat boche, which was, I mean, just wild in itself because that honey is crazy. But I attempted to back sweeten a small sample with buckwheat honey and uh, it was a little too much. Now this is it's buckwheat, which has its own little insanity to it. So I ended up back sweetening with like clover, but I using alternative honeys to counterbalance the scales is uh, I would say is almost next level mead making for people because it'll, it makes you really think about what you're putting in the brew instead of just assuming that it'll work. Absolutely. The, the most important step to me is, you know, after you're done fermenting, you know, once you know how to clean ferment the mead, mm -hmm. right. Then the next important step is the back sweetening. Uh, and what I do is I have all these little jars. I don't know if you can see this. I don't have anything on your video right now. No. Uh, yeah, you're, you don't have anything on your video currently. Wow. Uh, <laughs> hey. <nope>. <laughs> <laughs> all right. I don't know why the video wasn't there. Uh, that's all good. I have these little jars. So when I go to back sweeten, I have all these different honeys. And what I'll do is every time I buy a, you know, a bucket of honey, I'll put some in these little jars for taste testing later on. And I'll come up with some ideas on, you know, what kind of honey might go well with this. And I just mm -hmm. spoon in a little bit in a glass and taste it, you know? Yeah. No, that's, I, I, I love that. And I, I do that too, because you do, uh, don't want to commit too early and just start throwing things in. You can always take, uh, you can always put more in, you can't take things out. And I think that's something that sometimes people, especially with like, um, acid blends and stuff like that. They just start reading a recipe and then they say, Oh, I need a teaspoon of acid blend or whatever. And then they pitch it in their brew and then they're going, Oh my gosh, this is like, what happened here? You're like, well, you, you just dumped too much in, like you got to go small and then build it up. Um, yeah. Especially with acid. You don't want to over, over oh, it. No, you will. Yeah. I've, um, I've made the mistake and I won't make that mistake again because you have to do a lot of extra work to try and fix that, that problem you created for sure. Absolutely. So, well, now I can see, I can see your, your keys are before I was like, you're talking about it. I like the, I like that. Uh, did you end up building it? Yourself? I built that during the, uh, you know, when COVID first came around and I was bored to death. <laughs> yeah. I had just bought in the, 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 um, chest freezer just to use as a chest freezer or maybe a <laughs> fermentation chamber, temperature controlled. And, you know, COVID came around and I'm like, geez, yeah, let me make that a keyser. So yeah. Let's <laughs> That's perfect. Which, so I, got uh, a, that... I got a sizer in there. I have this, uh, the sweet clover session. And I also have a, an oatmeal stout that I made. Oh, so coming off of, uh, I'm assuming you've, since you like to make these, um, session traditionals and you're carbonating them how are you bottling do you have like the uh um what's it called last drop or are those little bottling wands for kegs or what are you doing normally yeah i i use the counter pressure filler i uh -huh. just because 
it's so important to keep the carbonation level at a certain point. Right. And if you're using a beer gun or if you're just filling off of a tap or off of a wand, you're going to, you're going to lose carbonation and it's not going to present the same as it did the way, the way it should be. So counter pressure fill all the way. It's a pain in the butt. It's one bottle at a time bottle out of the, you know, cause you got to have the bottle cold. Mm-hmm. You pull the bottle out of the freezer or refrigerator, counter pressure, fill it up one at a time, cap it, set it aside, go get the second bottle. <laughs> so it's a slow process, but it's a, it works great. Yeah. I've uh, recently started to look into doing that because I have kegging stuff like we're talking about, but I haven't uh, done much with giving brews away. And there are things like I'm, I'm sure you have that where, where you want to go give them to somebody and the only way to do it right and assume that, well, to give it to them and assume they might not get to it within a couple of days is to have those things. So um, it's a little bit tricky. And I think that's what scared me most about kegging to start was like, well, it's, it'd be nice to force car, but then how do I share it with my friends? And now that I'm in the, the mix of it all, it's, it's not, I'm already deeply committed with kegging. So might as well take the extra step and get the counter pressure filler and all that stuff. It's the, it's the whole rabbit hole thing, you know, once yeah. you start going down it, you just go deeper and deeper. Yeah. You're not getting out. That's the, that's the fun, th- fun thing about mead making to me is like, um, you very rarely meet somebody who's like, yeah, I stopped making mead a long time ago. Most people are like, whether it be one or two a year, like they still make a mead. It's just kind of like, it's kind of like an itch you have to scratch, at least for some people, once or twice a year. For some people like me, you know, or in you, dozens and dozens of times a year. Especially when I first started, because, you know, it's like, especially if you're making full ABV meads, it's going to be four to six months before it's really drinkable. So you got to just keep making it. Making it, making it, making it. When do I get to drink it? Nope, not yet. Keep making it, you know? <laughs> yeah, exactly. By the time you get to your tent. around where you can start drinking them and they're good, but yeah. It, so, um, and I, I kind of want to, I want to pivot a little bit because I have a question, you know, talking about old meads and things that you've been in this for five years. Um, have you noticed, maybe not with all meads, but with some of your older meads, a... I'd like to think of it like a bell curve in some ways that, you know, you're, you're the greatness or the best time. Oh, well, I don't know what the best way to say this is. Anyways, the meat is best at a certain point And then, you know, time keeps passing and it kind of dips down because you, you have passed the moment. Have you noticed that with any of your brews? Um, mead tends to get better with time. Is right. From what I've seen as long as you've stabilized it correctly. And that's the key, right? So initially, the stabilization that I did was, you know, K-meta, K-sorbate, but I was guessing, I was just putting in what, you know, the average amount you're supposed to put in for this. Mm -hmm. I I wasn't measuring it. I didn't know exactly what, you know, my sulfites levels were. So what I found down the road, a year or two later, was that some of my meads were turning brown and becoming bad mm. because I was not stabilizing correctly. So yeah. that's when I went and bought, you can see behind me there, mm-hmm. right? <laughs> the VIN metric, which measures sulfites. Mm. So now I can accurately measure my sulfites, get them where they're supposed to be for that pH, for that temperature, for that ABV, mm-hmm. uh, and, and do it correctly. And now my meads just last seen years and years and years and they're good so well i, and I only say that because i recently taste tested i've got i've got these little bottles of things that i made when i first started and they're you know this one is from 2017 and so we're getting pretty old but um most of these little bottles i did not stabilize at the time stabilize or metabis sulfide or any of those things uh most of them are, are past their life. They've kind of peaked and gone. And, you know, some elements are nice. Obviously, things like honey warmth and character can kind of flourish. But then um, because I didn't uh, necessarily do the right things, like you're saying, there's other flavors that they don't 
taste is great. You know, there's, it's, they've got some oxygen problems. And so, um, that, that is an important note for people. It, obviously this is a touchy subject because some people are listening or will listen and go, yeah, I'm never going to touch a sorbate made by sulfite. And, um, mm. and that's, that is completely how you want to brew. And I, I have no problem with that, but I personally agree with you. They do that help meads age in the long term, especially. Right. You want to fight that oxidation. I mean, you don't have to add those things, but drink it quickly. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I, uh, that, that has opened up my eyes even more to uh, what I should be doing properly. So let's talk about, we'll talk about some of those things then. Um, when you first started, what, uh, are there any things that you wish you had known early on? Obviously, we all go through lessons and learning and people like me dropping carboys. Is there anything that you would impart wisdom to people who are listening? Like, Absolutely. My pet peeve with uh, a lot of beginning mead makers is they want to make everything 18%, right? Yeah. To make a good mead, the mead has to have balance. Okay, so if you're going to make a traditional mead with just honey and then you want it to be 18%, that's not going to taste very good. Okay, you have to look at your end product. Do the flavors that I'm putting in this mead, are they bold enough to hold 18%? Mm -hmm. If not, don't make it 18%, right? Yeah. Scale it down. If you want to get drunk, go buy a bottle of whatever. (laughs) Yeah. If you want to make a great tasty mead, it's got to have balance. And, and to begin with that, you have to look at your end product. What, what are you envisioning it tasting like? What ingredients are you using? Then figure out what ABV you want it to be. Mm-hmm. Right? There's a little bit of guesswork in there, but you can, you can you know, not overshoot your uh, balance. Yeah. And, and for me, and I'm, I, you'll have to tell me your opinion on this, but balance, of course, is including your ABV to, to those things. But then talking about sweetness versus tannin versus acid and kind of finding the right balance between those. And some people might think um, it should be a 33, 33, 33 split. And I don't know that that's always true because obviously every brew is different. Um, how have you found... I guess obviously you recipe developed to create balance, but how have you found the best ways for you to balance like acid adjustments at this point? It's really, it's all about taste. Yeah. Um, for a while there, I got hung up on numbers, you know, mm-hmm. measuring pH. I want my pH to be 3.4. Mm-hmm. Oh, what if this need tastes better at 3.3 or 3.5, right? Yeah. You can't, don't always shoot for a, a gravity. Don't always shoot for a pH, right? You want to taste it. Let your taste buds tell you what's right. So, yeah, yeah when it comes to tannins, I will tell you that I, I put oak in almost everything. Mm-hmm. Almost everything. Maybe just a little bit or it may be a lot, depending on what I want out of it. Um, you know, it may be a, a light American oak. It might be a, you know, highly toasted French oak, whatever. Mm-hmm. depends on what I'm looking for at the end product. Um, and then acid is typically the last thing that I balance. And, and what I found is judges like a little more acid than I do. Mm. That's okay. interesting. <laughs> yeah, that's interesting. Hmm. I kind of want to unpack that in a moment. Talk about, um, I guess, tips and tricks for, uh, contest entries. But uh, on that note of balance, I do, uh, I like your progression of that, you know, acid balance, I feel like is definitely always last because again, you can always put things in, you can't take them out. Um, and same thing for sweetness, obviously you can over sweeten something and then you don't want to have to, it's not the worst thing in the world to blend stuff, but then you, it's a whole nother math equation you're throwing into the mix if you're, you're trying to figure that out. When you're talking about oak, are you, um, most of the time, are you adding oak post-fermentation or do you like to put it in the fermentation? Like what, what's your normal thing? I typically will put my oak in primary 
okay. um, and carry it forward into secondary. Uh, and I, it's, it's a taste thing. If, if the oakness gets to the point where I want it, I'll pull the oak out. Mm -hmm. If not, um, last ditch effort towards the end, I may add a little bit of liquid oak. Um, don't really like doing that, but it works okay. Interesting. That's really, I, that is funny you said that. So I just bought some and I've always been, well, I've always been curious about it to try it. So that's one of my things I'm going to try in the future is uh, I'm going to take um, some oak of some sort, which I guess and my question to you would be, what does liquid oak normally equate to a darker oak in general? Or do you find that it doesn't really matter? It, you know, is it, does it have a, any, any similar taste to some char of oak that you know of? Well, the, the oaks that I have purchased in my home brew store, there was only a couple of different types. Uh -huh. um, one was uh, supposedly a vanilla and one was supposedly a mocha. Mm -hmm. um, but even the vanilla one to me tasted more of a, a medium toast. It wasn't okay. really that light. So, so I've been, I would say they're, they were more on the dark side. Okay. I've been planning to like use it in a video and, and um, kind of do a, I'll say real oak, meaning I actually put oak in one and then the same brew, just put that oak extract, oak um, of not flavoring, whatever it is. And, and kind of take it to some friends and say like, Hey, which one do you like more? And not really tell them which is which and just kind of see, um, see what people think. So that's funny you mentioned that though. Uh, I've been doing more with Oak in the primary and I, I like it. I think uh, obviously it works well, <laughs> you know, if you're doing it, then that, that uh, makes me feel better. <laughs> yeah. I have found that uh, if, if you just throw a bunch of Oak in for a short period of time, you'll get some flavor, you'll get some, you know, mouthfeel, some tannins out of that, but you don't get the deep, rich oakness that you do if you put it in early and leave it in for a long time. Mm -hmm. So when you say going from primary to secondary, um, are you racking off into that secondary stage and, and then just like taking that oak and throwing it back in or, cause there's like obviously sediment and stuff. What's your protocol there? Right. Absolutely. So uh, that is a little, you know, I make sure my hands, everything, you know, gloves, everything is sanitized. Mm -hmm. If I'm going to take oak from one vessel and move it to another. Um, and obviously I'm trying to, because typically when I rack, there's going to be a little bit of fluid in the bottom with all of the, the, the yeast. So as I'm grabbing oak, I'm kind of swirling it around and getting all the yeast off of it. Yeah. And then transferring it into secondary. Now, mm -hmm. obviously I'm not getting all the yeast off, um, but most of it. And then down the road, I'm going to be transferring that again uh, before I do the fining agents and whatnot. But yeah, I, you know, that oak is still good. It's, it's, it's still imparting flavors, especially only after, you know, how long fermentation takes, you know, 10 right. days, a couple of weeks, whatever. It, there's a lot more that that oak can give to that, to that meat. Interesting. No, I, that, when you said that, I immediately was like, wait, how do you, I haven't, I haven't thought, I normally it's like, I'd either pitch new oak or something, but that's, uh, I might have to try that now. I want to switch over to Pymets real fast, and that'll kind of segue us into com competition entries. So you said, obviously, second and third place in the Pymet category at the Mazer Cup, which is very, very impressive. Oh. I, I've recently been kind of um, dipping my toes into the primary, uh, the Pymet, excuse me, um, mm -hmm. world, and it's fun. I really enjoy it, and it is such a cool, obviously, blend of the wine world and mead world. And it's just a, a fun thing. My question to you, you, you commented on your at least session meads. You said you like to give the yeast X amount of sugar to get them up to, uh, I don't recall if you said their ABV cap, ABV cap and, or if you just said where you need it and then you stabilize. Yeah. The ABV that I want for that. Mead. Okay. 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 Um, so are you doing a similar thing with pine mints or are you, you know, blasting the yeast with, uh, extra sugar to just cap them out? Like what's your protocol generally when it comes to pine mints? So a pine mint, I'm looking because it's a, a, a wine based mead. I expect it to be 
pretty full ABV, right? So I want it to be at least 12%. Uh -huh. Usually I shoot for primary to hit about 14 and a half ish mm -hmm. with my gravity. And then by the time I've, you know, added in whatever back sweetening at the end, I'm usually going to end up around 13 or so. Okay. Yeah. How are you? Oh, okay. I got two questions. <laughs> Sorry. My, uh, you, you've picked my brain completely and now I'm, I'm in full mode. Um, so how are you calculating your, uh, ABV percentages when you start to back sweeten like that. That's something that's always confused me, frankly, you know, 14 and a half percent brew you back sweeten. It's at 13% now. How did you get to that number? Well, you're adding volume without adding alcohol. So that's going to dilute your ABV down. So I use some online. Um, the one I use for a simple calculation like that is going to be Mead Maker's Batch Builder. Okay. Yeah. Uh, you can go under, under tools and they have a, uh, one of the tools is like a, a blend calculator. Mm. So you just plug those numbers of what you have and then what you added and it'll tell you what your ABV is now. Okay. Okay. I've always wondered, I, that's something that in YouTube comments, lots of people have always asked me, you know, how do you do this? And, or when I don't do it, they're like correcting me that, you know, this was 14%. Now it should be, 13.73. Okay, well, <laughs> sure. <laughs> so um, um, that, that was interesting. Um, I need to start using that. Online calculators are, are a great resource. Uh huh. I, I agree completely. Now, my other question um, do you have a, uh, a, I guess, couple favored and or favored yeast to use in your pie mitts at this point? Obviously, there's a, there are way more appropriate yeast for each one, but. So, you know, most of the piments that I've made have been the, the, the big red piments, uh, the Cabernets. Um, I also really like uh, Petite Syrah. So what I do is I, I use the Scott Labs um, handbook. Mm -hmm. And that is an invaluable resource that's oh, available so free online. You go in there, what kind of grape are you using? And it'll tell you what yeast do well with that grape. And at what temperature they like to be fermented at, blah, 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 blah. Personally, I really like for my red, big red piments, uh, BM 4x4, mm -hmm. a good, really good yeast, and also like RC212. Okay. I've been, um, that, that I like, you're affirming everything that I am feeling right now because I have been doing more with RC212. Uh, 212, 212. And then um, that that BM 4x4 has appeared a lot more in my world. And I, I, those are both yeast that I want to spend more time with, of course, in Pi Mint land. Um, but also, I think it'd be fun to experiment some in, in uh, I guess, regular mead realm, kind of see what kind of things they impart, especially that 4x4. From what I understand, it, it gives a lot of body. Mm -hmm. um, would you say you've, you've had experience with that previously? It helps... Right. Establish. Yeah. So again, you know, you go back to the Scott lab handbook and it'll tell you what those yeasts will do as far as enhancing uh, varietal character, as far as mouthfeel. Um, so yeah, that's what I'm looking for. I like a, especially if I'm going to go for a, a big, bold red pie mint, I want, yeah, you know, heavy mouthfeel, right? Yeah. So I'm going to use other adjuncts besides just the proper yeast. Um, you know, I'm going to use Opti Red in my fermentation. Um, I'm going to use FT Rouge um, mm -hmm. to give it more mouthfeel. All these things add up to a better end product. Mm -hmm. um, so is there, a, uh, is there a brew that you have wanted to make at this point that like, you earlier we were talking about the mango you know you've, you've always wanted mango has been kind of one of your uh your i don't know aspiring brews to to do great at is is there anything else that you are um wanting to work on to get to that contest point um you know braggots kind of mm. um, interests me and i actually entered and made one braggot and it actually 
I think it placed second in a, in a big comp. But, man, to get the balance right on a bracket between a, a beer and a mead is just it, – it's so touchy. So, mm -hmm. um, And it's good to have a keezer or to go out and buy different brews and to mix with your maybe traditionals that you've made and blend them and kind of see what goes. Yeah, that's a, a good way to do a bracket as well. Yeah. Are you doing all grain? Are you doing malt extracts? What are you like with your beers at this point? Anytime I brew, it's all grain. Okay. I don't brew that much. My wife is actually the big beer brewer. Oh, that's fun. Yeah. She's the one that got me involved in brewing period, but uh, I have tinkered around with brewing beer. Um, and you know, if we have a beer on tap, we have a meat on tap and I think maybe those two profiles will mix. It's easy, right? Yeah. <laughs> no 50 50 40 60 whatever you know yeah um and that's what i did i actually took uh a whip a whip beer that i made and mixed it with the basswood traditional that i made called it bass wit and it actually did very well i re i really want to try basswood now i've tried a lot of these honeys and uh, i made a lot of traditionals and um i one of my big things I like to do with my channel is it, it doesn't necessarily yield a lot of views, but it's a lot of fun. I do a tournament where I take 16 brews of some sort and uh, kind of face them against each other and then get some friends over and we taste test and we decide which one moves on. So I've done it three times now. This next one I want to do is a, like a traditional mead tournament. And I have 15, I'm about to have 16 traditional meads and basically just do the same thing, you know, kind of mix and match them and then make them battle quote <laughs> and uh, see which one's better and come down to the last two. But in all my time making traditional meads, I've never used basswood. I've heard about it a lot, but I've also found uh, as we kind of talked about earlier, the blending of honeys can create so many cool combinations, but there are also so many insane kinds of honeys that, you would never know unless you get on Amazon or get on the website and just try it. And that's, it's just so fun. Yeah. My whole cupboards over here are just filled with these little jars of different honeys that I've accumulated over the years. Um, one of my favorites actually, and it's really hard to get a hold of now is this little, I don't know if you can see it. Zambian wildflower. Oh. Zambian from Africa. Ooh. And that honey is my secret weapon for my pie mints. It imparts a huge amount of tobacco and leather. Oh, interesting. And, and literally, if I get people around in here and I open up that five-gallon bucket of Zambian, uh -huh. everybody's like, whoa. It just fumigates the whole room. It's, it's kind of like Eastern buckwheat has that kind of horse blanket nastiness mm -hmm. to it. Yeah, yeah, multiply that times 10. Oh, man. That's, <laughs> that, that is um, a little vivid because buckwheat, I still have probably 15 pounds of buckwheat sitting back behind me that I need to find something to do with. That stuff's powerful. I mean, you only have to put a half a pound in a, a three-pound batch, and you've done enough with buckwheat to call it good. <laughs> to me, uh, buckwheat is smooth compared to this stuff. <laughs> But, so you know, this stuff's the hard stuff <laughs> used at the right percentage, right? I only used 15, 20%, you know, of the, of the Zambian, but like I said, it for a wine. And if you're somebody that knows wine and the flavors that are, that are good in a wine, you know, tobacco and leather are traits that we want to, that we want to taste. So. Yeah, no, those are when you, immediately when you said that, I was like, man, I've been trying to get those flavors for a long time. Obviously, it's it's tough to do um, in a normal facet, I would say. So let's switch to competitions. Obviously, you know, you you are the 2021 Mead Maker of the Year, and um, you have a lot of experience in not only entering competitions but stuff like recipe development and and, and those things. You mentioned earlier um, that you've noticed judges often are looking for a little more acid balance, not balance, but more acidity, I would say, than you're used to. Is there any other 
anything that you've noticed in your time sending meads to judges that has shocked you like that? A couple of things is if if you want to enter comps and you 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 tell yourself, well, I'm not going to send this because I don't think it's that good. Well, take a step back because unless it's bad, send it because those two or three judges that sit down and judge it might like it, especially if it's kind of different and off the, the, the beaten path of uh, ingredients that other people are using. Judges like things that are different. Um, but yeah, it's, it's uh, uh, playing the whole competition thing. It takes uh, time to learn what the judges like and don't like. Uh, when it comes to acid, I, I typically like when I when I'm doing my my fruit meads, berry meads, pie mints, I, I like the smoothness of it, right? The judges, especially for the big comps like Mazer Cup, they want that fruit, that berry, that pie mint. They want it to, to bite a little bit. They want it to be mm-hmm. there. Interesting. Uh-huh. So and this all came about after I took some of my meads over to Carvin Wilson's house because I had been doing well in the comps and placing well in the comps, but I was, for some reason, I couldn't win a Mazer Cup. And so I brought my, luckily I live close enough to Carvin and we're friends. Every once in a while, I get to bring my stuff over to him and he tried them. And he's like, yeah, these are all really good. They'll do really good in most of the comps, but they need more acid. So I added more acid, and the result was five Mazer cups. <laughs> wow. <laughs> oh. Well, so um, I guess that kind of leads me to my next question, which is, have you submitted any repeat like recipes? Like you brewed it one year, and then you were like, I think this next time I can do, I can do it better. So that you submitted the version two or version three. Have you had anything like oh. that previously? Yeah, absolutely. Like um, one of my most successful first batch meads was a dry, traditional fireweed honey. Um, Every contest that I entered it in, it it took first place. I I don't particularly like dry meads, but I also know that the numbers that get entered into most comps, dry meads or a smaller number of oh, yeah. entries. Smaller mm-hmm. amount of entries means I have a higher chance of winning a medal, mm-hmm. right? So there's little things like that that come into play when you want to try to get points. Um, but yeah, the fireweed traditional dry did very well. So I, I did it again, you know, batch two. Um, I looked at the feedback from the first batch, you know, and I tweaked it a little bit. Not much, but just a little bit based on the feedback that I got. And, man, it's every contest, first place, first place, first place. It scored low to mid 40s in every comp except for one. For some reason, those two judges, and this is the whole, you know, subjective thing, it scored like a 20-something. Interesting. Which was well, ridiculous. <laughs> <laughs> and that's – that's a uh, um... – I think it's also an important thing to note for anyone who is submitting meads to be judged. um, Obviously you're, you're submitting meads to people, to to people. I I think that's the stopping there is what's important because we can of course love to assume that the people judging have tons and tons of experience and we want to have those people judging our meads. Um, But even if that's true, it still comes down to some personal preference. So like you said, obviously, five out of six pairs of judges said, Hey, this thing is awesome. And then one, one of the six were like, ah, this is not, not my thing. It's easy for us to, um, to look at that feedback and go, well, this is crap. Cause these, this one group of people said, Oh man, they didn't like it. So submitting your things to multiple avenues, like you'd mentioned is super important. While, such and such person might not have liked it. That doesn't mean that, you know, this next crew won't. And um, I also like, not just because it's Carvin. I like Carvin a lot. He's a great dude. But I think importantly, 
having people around you to taste test your stuff and to bounce ideas. And it, of course it helps when there are people like Carvin Wilson who have <laughs> so much mead making experience. Um, but having people to balance and say like, Hey, what do you like about this? What do you don't will can only make your brewing better because you're starting to get lots of palates in one, one place. Yeah. And my other big advice was, is, you know, when you're learning how to make mead, drink a lot of mead, make a lot of mead. Um, if, if there's a local brew club that you can join um, and enter your meads into that, also think about judging. You know, I, I am now a, a BJCP certified mead judge. Um, and so I get to taste meads from all over the place when I, when I go to these comps and judge. And that's, that's huge because, you know, you get little local um, – kind of clicks where the meads all kind of taste the same. And then, but if you get meads from another state or another area of the country, they just bring in a whole different, you know, kind of flavor profile than, than what you're used to. Some of it's based on, you know, local ingredients that are available, but you need to taste meads from all over. That's the bottom line. Yeah. And that, you know, I'm, I'm drinking one right now. There's a moonlight meadery. It's it, you are uh, not only investing to help those people who are these meteries who need us, need the consumers, but also you are expanding your palate and, and getting, um, I'm not going to say that every single commercial mead is, is good. Cause I, I, that would be a very bold statement to say, but when you find these big time meteries that are obviously successful, superstition, moonlight, um, uh, I'm blanking on other ones right now, because I'm on the spot. But when you find these uh, mead making uh, uh, meaderies who are doing great things, get a bottle from them and right. see what you can identify and share it with a friend. Because then have the friend ask them what they get from it. But developing palate, obviously you've spent time developing your palate and that's important for people to know. I, I don't think you would, you would be where you are today if not for the people, of course, that you shared your mead with. But also for... I'm sure the time you spent experimenting, developing your palate through experimentation, um, it's, yeah. it's research. I mean, it's no better way to say it. <laughs> Just make a lot of meat, drink a lot of meat. You know, I'm lucky enough to have, you know, superstition meadery in my, in my backyard, which is, you know, probably, I, I think, the, the largest or least production meadery in the United States. Uh-huh. And they make some awesome stuff and, you know, I can go downtown and grab a flight of their stuff, which changes and rotates and, and, you know, not only them, but just, you know, ordering stuff through uh, Vino shipping and, and I go to Mazer cup and I, and I judge there sometimes. And uh -huh. when I come home, when I come home, I, I bring a bunch of leftover meads from all these different commercial and home uh, mead makers and just, uh -huh. just keep tasting different stuff. Yeah, you'll never regret, first of all, drinking mead. I mean, I, I'm sure if you drink enough of it, you might get not feel great in the morning. But at the end of the day, at the end of the week, let's say, you'll never regret all the things you tried. Um, it's, it's always a lot of fun. It, I'm very envious that you are by Superstition because I've, I've actually been able to chat with them before. And, I mean, they, they're not only there's great people doing great stuff, but I've had some of their meads, and it's they have some fantastic stuff. So I, I'd highly recommend anybody listening. They, they do ship to a lot of places in the U S which is super nice. And not all meteries do that. There are a lot of places that are still pretty exclusive to X States. Um, yeah. They do a lot of international shipping as well. They're, they're very well known. Yeah. They're, they're doing great. All right. So I got one, I guess, well, wrapping up questions. Um, I won't, I won't keep you all night. I know you got other things to do with your work, your life. Um, so in, in all of your experience in entering com uh, competitions, we kind of talked about, you know, balance and, and what judges are expecting when you give them Bruce. Um, is there any other, I guess, advice you, you give to somebody who's, developing a recipe with intentionality to hopefully be able to submit it. Obviously most of it boils down to is the meat good, but is there any aspect of um, recipe creation and uh, competition entry that go hand in hand at this point? 
Yeah, like you said, the biggest thing is going to be it has to be a, a pretty, you know, a decent mead. It can't have, you know, any kind of major flaws. Um, but if it's a decent mead, send it in. Don't don't uh, not send it in because you don't think it's quite right. I've had meads um, that I sent in that I didn't think were the best. Um, and then they ended up winning medals. So don't just quickly discount any meads that are decent, right? Obviously, you want to think that they're great, but your palate and their judge's palate may be totally different. Um, get feedback from, from, if you can, local people that are, you know, maybe judges, if, if possible, depending on where you're from. Um, you know, friends and family are always going to lie to you and tell you how good it is. So that those are not a good, uh, a good way to judge your mead. Um, but yeah, send it in. You know, even if you fail to begin with and your mead score crappy, hey, you're going to learn something from it. Read the judge's feedback. Take that feedback. Go back to the drawing board. Tweak that recipe and go at it again. And you know, like I was saying earlier on the on the firewood that was winning first place everywhere and scoring hot mid 40s and all of a sudden scored a 20 something, that's going to happen here and there. So, you know, don't get uh, too discouraged for one bad feedback. Now, if you send it to a couple of different contests and you get low scores, then there's probably a problem. But yeah, keep at it. Keep at it and learn. I've definitely seen that. That's something being in the creative sphere of making videos for every, you know, 10, 20 nice comments I get. There's always one person who's, whether it be something super mean or just a little bit mean, you know, they always say something and it is easy for us to focus on the negative, focus on the, the one comment that makes you go, oh man, that feels like it hurts instead of the five or six that really kind of say, Hey, good job. So I, I think you're right. You know, I, um, unless you're getting a significant amount of those comments, uh, they're probably just somebody who is not necessarily liking what you're sending, which is not the end of the world. Obviously it's all palette driven. So, and, and I also look at this, when I look at the score sheets, there's going to be an area that's given the judges information, you know, look at their credential. You know, a lot of times these comp comps don't have enough highly qualified judges to go around. So they're going to pair up maybe one experienced judge with somebody that's a total novice. So, you know, look at the credential, you know, and, and take it with a grain of salt. Yeah. So I, I feel like one of the big overarching themes and and I think it's true of, of a lot of people, but specifically what you've kind of preached is um, don't stop trying to make mead. And obviously listening to, to feedback is super important. I think that's, I know that you've uh, you've been surrounded by great people. Having Carvin Wilson on your side, having I'm, I've no doubt the immense amount of other people who surround you uh, with you has has helped you in your world. But I do think that your experience in in sending meads off, and as daunting as it is, we kind of started this whole thing off by talking about how, about the massive amount of uh, money it takes to ship off brews and time commitment and all of these things. While that is is daunting and uh, nerve wracking, that's the only way you're really gonna uh, honestly get to the point where you're at as the the MMA meat maker of the year. There's, I doubt that anyone who's ever made it high on the rankings has only submitted one or two things. You probably sub have to submit a lot of things in order to get to where you're at, and yeah. um, and that's not a bad thing. That just shows that you got to throw your net out as far as you can, as many nets as you have. And, and the good thing about all that, you put all that work in, you know, you spend the money, you send your meads out at different comps and you get to the point where you're, you're winning. And, but the bottom line is now you're making better meat. Yeah. Right? And, and, and that's what we're looking for. Yeah. Well, Alan, I, I greatly appreciate all of your, your time. And, um, I, I love that you have, um, kind of given myself and everybody listening the initiative to to go and make more mead and um i think you said it best and i actually felt this the exact same thing you said earlier about you know uh, you kind of commented you just got to make more 
and that's kind of where I was at with these. I mentioned these earlier, you know, these were my first five or six and I, and I, I was trying them the other day and I, most of them were not great. And I, I said, and it kind of reflected if I had stopped making mead, if I'd made five meads and stopped and then waited four and a half years to taste them and then tasted these, I would have been really disappointed and probably just given up. But because I have, I, I said, no, I'm going to keep going and make more and more and more. I not only know what I did wrong here, but I also know that I have the skills now to make a better mead because of all that experience. So experience is key. I think. Experience, you know, read a lot too, you know, get online, uh, get it mixed in with some groups that have a lot of experience. You know, I learned a lot from modern mead makers, Facebook group, mm -hmm. uh, there's other groups out there that, you know, have a lot of people that have made a lot of meats that have a lot of good experience. Um, you know, the internet's great. Problem is there's a lot of bad information in the internet. There's a lot of great information on the internet. How do you decide what is the bad and what is the good? Mm -hmm. um, that's why I think it's better to get in with a, a group, an active group that's currently involved in making mead, competing meads, and, and, and get their feedback. Yes. Yes. I, uh, especially if you're, if you have one local, it is a valuable source. There are people in there that, um, have way more experience than like, there are a lot of humble people in those groups. I feel like a lot of people who are just people who've homebrewed for a long time and they're not necessarily, you know, they, they might not be interesting entering competitions, but that doesn't mean that they aren't valuable palettes and those things. So getting connected with your community. Um, and then I, I did love that you said, cause it's something that I feel like I've said before, you know, giving your meads to your, your mom or dad or brother or sister, like it's, it's great, but they're just going to give you the thumbs up and tell you how cool you are. They're not going to give you the valuable feedback and say like, Hey, this isn't very good. Or, Oh, this is, you know, whatever. Exactly. So um, Alan, thank you so much for your time. This has been a blast. Uh, I I love that I can I can get to chat with people like you, pa people who have such a passion for mead making. And I feel like while a lot of times people will assume that you know mead maker of the year is your pinnacle, I don't I don't think that's true of you. I think that I, I know that I'm going to see your meads high ranking on tons of mead competitions in 2022 um if you're submitting i don't know if, if you at this point if you decided ah, i did it i'm out but actually uh, i'm taking uh 2022 off as far as the um amma comp circuit i'm, uh -huh. I'm going to enter some Mazer cup entries but i also plan to be back hard at it in uh 2023 right now i'm building up my uh stock so to speak Oh yeah, I you can only imagine you probably have depleted a lot yeah. going through that. I only do mostly two and a half to three gallon batches, sometimes five. So I I deplete them fast. Yeah. Oh yeah, especially if you're sending out so many bottles. There's the your your ammunition's gone. Well, regardless, I I anticipate and I cannot wait to see how you do in the Mazer Cup. Um, my my hope is to uh, also enter the Mazer Cup. I have I have low expectations, but. I, I sure hope that things go well. Thank you again for your time. Um, if there's anything uh, we can ever, I can point people to for you, uh, let me know, but I will, um, I can't wait to see what happens in 2022 for you. Yeah, it's been great talking with you. I love you know, sharing information on me. It's my passion and I can, you know, the first thing I tell people when they ask me about meat is, you know, how much time do you have? And so, <laughs> yeah, we got about 20 minutes. We'll, uh, <laughs> I, can, I can give you the debriefing real fast. <laughs> all right. So, all right, Alan, thank you again. And uh, we'll talk to you later. All right. Take care.